Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Anybody have any strange encounters since last night? Anybody? No? You're all good? Awesome. Not doing my job well enough then if you're not having <laughs> strange encounters. So. All right. So um, I don't know much, much of this I said last night, but <clears throat> I'm having a conversation with Danny Silk a number of years ago and saying, what, what are Bethel doing for apostles? Because I think I might be one but I don't even know what one is. And his response to me was, well, why don't you do something? And it wasn't like, oh, you do something. He's like, hey, maybe this is on you to do. And of course, what, what it's, what, what that, because I kind of thought I knew everything about what a pastor was, and I kind of knew what an evangelist was, and I thought I knew everything. And then realizing, sorry, I need to just switch my phone off. Then realizing that the, the more I got into this, the, the less I thought, the less I knew. Um, and my paradigm up until then had been some of the teaching that, <coughs> that that's around f on the fivefold. So you've, if you, has anybody heard Danny Silk's teaching on the fivefold? So you know, pray for the prophets. They've got a lot going on. Uh, prophets are a bit weird. Pastors want to keep everybody happy. All that kind of stuff. And the more I dug into this, I realized actually none of that's true. Like that, that it make great sermons, but it doesn't make good Bible. And if we're going to do some stuff, then let's see if there, if we've got Bible for it. You know, is there a Bible for it? And um, the great thing about the Bible is that it's full of information. And what what I think has has happened, and this is my take on it. What I think has happened when we've started to talk about apostles, particularly, but the the rest of the fivefold, is that we have. Um, made the text say what we already believe. That we, we've come in with a preconceived notion and we've made the text something that we, that we believe. And the assumption is that everybody knows what an apostle is. So part of my mandate, uh, I think, in life, and it it's, hasn't been given by God, it's certainly something that's been given by me, is that I want to remove the word apostolic from our lexicon because we have no idea what it means. You know, you have a real apostolic gift. Well, there is no such a thing as an apostolic gift in Scripture. So I believe there's an apostle. But the apostolic isn't a gift. Neither is evangelism. If you, if you can find the gift of evangelism in Scripture, I will give you $100 right now. It's a $100 bill. If you can find the gift of evangelism in Scripture, I'll give you this $100 bill. And we talk about that a lot, you know, oh, they have a real gift of evangelism. We've just made up a gift that isn't actually in Scripture. You know, I, I have a gift of evangelism, but I don't know if I'm, if I'm an evangelist. People talk nonsense, right? They're talking about stuff that isn't actually in the Bible. That See, that person have a real pastoral anointing. Where, where do we get that from? Is there a chapter and verse for a pastoral anointing? No. So, so we get really confused. And we all know what a teacher is, right? We know what a teacher is. Well, do we? Because it's mentioned like three times. The, the ability to teach is mentioned three separate occasions. And I think they refer to three separate things. So if you're an overseer of a church, if you're an elder in a church, you should be what Scripture calls apt to teach, able to teach. Does that mean you have, you, you're a teacher? No. And then there's a Romans 12 gift, which is the gift of teaching. So just because you have the gift of teaching doesn't mean you're a five-fold teacher because that's a separate thing altogether, right? So, so what are all these things? And I realize some of the stuff that I believe. So my heart is actually to have a conversation about the fivefold with, with other leaders and not be so scary um, because I'm poking a little bit and saying, do you have Bible for that? Like you've just told me something that someone has a gift of evangelism. Do you have Bible for that? Well, it's all throughout scripture. Is it really? And then I've, I've heard this teaching that apostles that Jesus called the 12 
and give them a secular title. You all heard that teaching? Did he know? So there's a teaching that's pretty common that Jesus called the dis his dis 12 of his disciples and made them apostles. And what apostles were is this secular term. This is the way the teaching goes. It was this secular term about someone who would go into an area and maintain the culture of Rome. So Rome would go in, they would conquer a city, and actually they didn't have to fight that much because most cities, when they heard the Roman army were coming, they just went, we surrender. And then they would appoint what they, what this is the teaching says, they would appoint someone who was the apostle or the cultural ambassador so that the culture would look like Rome's. And the teaching is then, so apostles are cultural ambassadors from heaven, and we have to create heaven's culture here on earth. I can find zero, now that's really popular in our stream. I can find zero credible sources in that, and if you can find credible sources, then please let me know so that I can be corrected. I can find one author quoting another author, but no historical uh, credible sources. So we have this teaching that apostles are the cultural ambassadors of heaven, and that's what an apostle does, and creates the culture of heaven so that heaven's attracted to earth, and that's what they do. The problem with that is, again, there's no, I can find no historical evidence for it, but it's also not the model that we have for apostles. So the only, the only kind of model we have for apostles in our stream are the Randy Clarks, Bill Johnsons, Heidi Bakers. Th these are people that are leading thousands of churches. You know, Bethel, for example, in their network have like something like 13 and a half thousand churches. They're globally related to Bethel. You've got um, Catch the Fire that has maybe 15,000 churches that relate to Catch the Fire. They would call themselves a partner, uh, you know, Catch the Fire partners they are now. They used to be partners in Harvest. And that's our model. That's, that's got nothing, I would suggest that's got nothing to do with being a cultural am ambassador and creating a culture within an area. So, so we don't even know what an apostle is. When people come to me and say, you know, I, I've actually had a prophetic word. I got a prophetic word that um, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. I will ask them what the prophetic word was and what did the person mean by using the term apostle. Because sometimes we just misinterpret, the, pro, the you know, whatever God's revealing. We get the, you know, we get the image or something like that or we hear something and we just interpret it wrong because we think that's what an apostle does. Um, so I would say a lot of the prophetic words about being an apostle and being a prophet are probably misleading. So what do they do? What does a, what does a pastor do? I, I think there's a great example of it in Scripture, which is Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, right? The, that's what a pastor does. A pastor is a shepherd of the sheep. And then you have this description. So what's, the Lord is my shepherd. What's the next bit? Right, and, and the, the word want is lack for anything. Right, I shall have no lack in my life. So does that mean if you're experiencing lack that the Lord isn't your shepherd? I think part of the pastor's anointing, the grace of being a pastor, is that you actually, you know, people feel that their needs are getting met. And that there should even be a financial benefit to that. That they should, that like a part of the shepherd's anointing is to walk into an environment and create prosperity. Not to make sure everybody's happy. I don't know if you've ever encountered a five-fold pastor um, the, the actual guy in my life who gets to correct and adjust me at times uh, when I let him is, da is Danny Silk. And Danny is absolutely a five-fold pastor. Now, last year, Danny was involved, and he's still involved in a process with a, well, a leader in the church called um, Jonathan. And jo Jonathan Welton uh, had made a bunch of bad decisions. And Danny was involved with him, and Danny sent this letter out to everybody in his contact list. And the letter was 
pretty abrupt, have nothing to do with this person. I got some texts and calls from people saying, that was a bit harsh. Like, that was a bit harsh. And he was a bit harsh. Well, part of the shepherd's job was actually to kill lions and bears. Like, that's part of their job. They're not, they're not the mealy-moused kind of person that we've made pastors out to be. In fact, I would say the church has been hurt more by false pastors than false apostles or prophets. That what we've done is we've said, this person is a pastor, and they're not a pastor. They're just a hurt person full of mercy. That we've confused pastoring with mercy. And the most merciful person we can think of, well, they're, they're just a real pastor's heart. No, pastors are ruthless. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, I am, they have to be if they're going to, like, pastors are the ones that say, um, that person is a wolf. Like, you, you, you understand, you understand that the Bible talks about a wolf in sheep's clothing, not a wolf in shepherd's clothing. So we're always looking for the wolf in the pulpit. It's not, there's sheep. <laughs> right, so pastors will say, hey, this person is a wolf, and they need to not be part of this community anymore. Right, that's what, that's what pastors do. I, pastors want to protect their flock. I, you know, I've gotten to know Danny Silk for a number of years, and he's, he was ministering in our church one year, and I had lost my mom. I had had a, I'd had a really hard time uh, for a couple of years, and I wasn't telling anybody about it. I was just soldiering on, and uh, <clears throat> There was stuff going on with, you know, one of my kids, and it was just a hard, hard season. And Danny came in, and it was one of these explosive weekend conferences. You know, it was glitter, it was feathers, it was fire, it was people not wanting to leave the building. I mean, my ministry was incredible. <laughs> I mean, it was. It was one of those, like, weekends where it's like, shabba, and everybody's falling down, you know? It was just, I was on fire. And then... Danny's having lunch with me and my board uh, on the Sunday just before we took him to the airport. And I said, so Danny, go. You're free to speak into whatever. And he said, thank goodness. I, I didn't know how to bring this up. This is literally what he did in front of all my board, in front of like 10 people. I'm sitting like this, and Danny's here, and he's like, whatever this is needs fixed. Whatever is going on with you is just not good. I said, Danny, there's this book called The Culture of Honor. I think you should read it. <laughs> so I'm not feeling very honored right now. This was in front, of, in front of people. He didn't quietly take me to the side and say, hey, let's talk. What's going on with your heart? How's your heart? He wasn't doing that. He was protecting me and protecting our church. And it didn't feel great. I have to say it didn't feel great at the time. And afterwards, you know, it started this process of recovery for, for, for me. And I had my board all going, yes, this is great. Get, get into him. And he, he kept going, what's going on? What's going on? You have no passion. Where's your fire? Like, in front of everybody. He's a pastor. Not full of mercy. He's a pastor. Mercy is actually a different gift. You understand that? It's a... It's a different thing. Because you've got these three listings of gifts in the New Testament. You have Romans 12, you have Ephesians 4, and you have 1 Corinthians 12. And we get them all mixed up. They're completely different. Like, completely different. We think a leader is an apostle. I'm going to let you into a secret. There's no such a thing as marketplace apostles. Okay? Just letting you into that secret right now. It's, it's made up. It's completely fabricated. You're called to the church. You're equipping the church. Uh, but what we've done is if we, have a, if we have a Romans 12 paradigm, then we're going to see leaders as apostles. And we're going to say you have to be over 10,000 churches before you're actually really an apostle, which would obviously mean that the apostle John wasn't an apostle because he had maybe seven 
that he was writing to. Right? So, there's no such a thing as marketplace apostles. We've got Romans 12 confused with Ephesians 4. And I know there are dear people that I respect and admire <coughs> that teach that uh, Priscilla and, uh, and Aquila were, you know, marketplace apostles. The problem is there's no Bible for that. We're told that they're servants, ministers, not that they're actually equipping people to minister anyway. So we, we've, we've got this confusion thing going on. And part of the confusion is that you, in Romans 12, you've got um, this leadership thing and, and you have a gift of teaching. That doesn't mean that it's the same as the Ephesians 4. And do you know how you know that? Because teaching is never mentioned in Ephesians 4. Ever. The teacher is. But teaching as a gift isn't mentioned. Okay, let's, let's, what's a teacher then? What's the difference? So I think a Romans 12 is about rightly dividing the word of God. I think Romans 12 is about bringing division into the church. Right? Everybody who believes this, come to me. And everybody who's wrong, go over there. That's what teaching does, Right? So, that's not what Ephesians 4 does. Ephesians 4 is supposed to bring unity. Like the fivefold is supposed to bring unity. That's actually the purpose of, one of the purposes of the fivefold. So, any prayer meeting that you're having about unity won't happen. Unity simply won't happen without the fivefold. It's impossible. We're just doing busy work. Let's actually have, let's have a prayer breakfast for unity will work. That's not the strategy in, in the kingdom. The strategy is the fivefold. You bring the fivefold, you're going to get unity. And it's going to hurt. It's, it's going to hurt a lot. Because people will wrestle against it. Meanwhile, the apostles are kind of going, I know. I know. It's hard. I know. So, teachers in the fivefold, the teacher in the fivefold is actually supposed to be uh, bringing alignment, teaching about bringing alignment, teaching about the kingdom, and teaching people how to do this stuff. That's what the teacher does. They impart a grace on people's lives that isn't just information, but it's also activation. Now, I think all the fivefold should be teach should be teaching. I think they should all teach, but that doesn't mean they're all teachers. So one's dividing, the other one's bringing unity, and really uh, digging into the the information and the activation for the kingdom. And then you've got the evangelist. What's an evangelist? They have a gift of evangelism. No, they don't. And you've got this model that says the evangelist hit the church. Listen, if you hit the church, you're not an evangelist. You're hurt. Right? You're just hurt. You're someone who's hurt and maybe with an agenda, but you're not an evangelist. And that there is this theory that evangelists, that, well, why are we gathering? Why are we spending money on buildings when we could be out saving the lost? That's not what an evangelist does. Let me explain to you what an evangelist does. So I have somewhere in here. This wonderful thing. This is an American Express Platinum card. Ooh. This is, gr this is great. It's really expensive. It's probably one of the more expensive car credit cards that you can get. Let me, let me what's that? It, no, th so the, the thing about this is you have to pay it off every month. Right? That's the thing about American Express is you have to pay it off every month. Right? So it's a good thing. But it's $500 a year for this. Wow. But let me tell you what you get for it. And if anybody wants to apply for it, please, I'll send you a code. You can get some miles. I'll get some miles. That's great. Let me tell you what you can get for this. I get $200 Uber credit every year. So anytime I use an Uber, it comes off my $200. It's great, right? I get upgraded in every, almost every hotel chain that exists. I, I'm automatically a platinum or premium member with this. Isn't that great? 
So you stand in a hotel, and they'll every once in a while, every couple of times you stay in a hotel, they'll upgrade you to a suite. My wife and I stayed in a, we have this tradition just before Christmas, we go out do some shopping, have, have a nice meal, and we spend the night in a hotel just close to our area. But it's this really nice hotel, and we book a $100 room, and they gave us the presidential suite this year. We didn't want to leave. Honestly, do we have to go home? <laughs> don't make us go home <laughs> where there's children and cleaning and people don't, you know. Phenomenal. I pick an airline, so I, I fly American. And anything I buy on the airplane is reimbursed. So, yeah, I'll take 10 packets of Pringles at $6 each that you would never in a million years buy. But yeah, give me those Pringles. Yeah. Um, I have a I have a dedicated concierge. So, what's say say there's a big sporting event or a concert. So your concert tickets are released at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. I call American Express and say, "Get me two two tickets, please." I don't have to do anything. They're on the line at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning booking me two tickets. If there's a restaurant that I can't get into, I call them and say, hey, get me into that restaurant whenever. And they will call every morning. It's like having your own personal assistant. Isn't that great? But it's the upgrade thing. It's getting upgrades. It's getting your money back. It's all of this kind of stuff. So it's a great, I mean, anybody that travels, any itinerant or anybody that's traveling, I heartily recommend that they get this card. I've just become an evangelist for the American Express Platinum Card. <laughs> That's what an evangelist does. An evangelist will constantly tell you the benefits of belonging. Evangelists are the ones that are saying, hey, you know what? This is, this is not the gospel of salvation. This is the gospel of the kingdom. And in the gospel of the kingdom, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the good news is preached to the poor. That's what evangelists do. Evangelists are going to come in and say, do you know what you get for belonging? You don't just get to go to heaven. You get heaven to come to you right now. Do you want to experience that? Do you want to experience a little bit of heaven? That's what evangelists do. They're constantly explaining the benefits of belonging to the kingdom so that you kind of go, well, why would I not want an American Express platinum card? It's great. It's not the gift of evangelism. It's the gift of explaining the benefits of the kingdom to people. So we know what a pastor is a little bit. We know what a teacher is a little bit. We know what an evangelist is a little bit. Then you've got the weird prophet. And it's tricky because it's mentioned everywhere. You've got prophecy. You've got the gift of prophecy. And then you've got the prophet. And because they all sound the same, it sounds like that's what, it's a continuum or it's all much of a muchness. It's really not. So the prophet, what does a prophet do? Well, prophet, this is my opinion. If the prophet is the most prophetically gifted person in their sphere, they're not a prophet. They have a great gift of prophecy but they're actually not a prophet. Because prophets are supposed to impart something else to people that they can go higher and do greater works than they can do. Like that's kind of the principle of being. So frequently in churches you'll get someone who's incredibly prophetically gifted and everybody thinks they're a prophet. No. Why do you have to like be unsatisfied with the gift of the Holy Spirit and go after the gift of Jesus? Do you know how that will make Jesus feel? not to mention the Holy Spirit. Like you get, particularly with the prophetic stuff, you, you get people thinking, well, the gift of prophecy isn't good enough for me. I need to be a prophet. That's just wrong on so many levels. It's not being promoted. One isn't better than the other. We're constantly thinking hierarchy and all that kind of nonsense, whereas Jesus is thinking family. <coughs> and, you know, to sort of, to sort of discard the gift of the Holy Spirit to go after what you really want, which is the gift of Jesus being a prophet, is just wrong. 
So what does a prophet do? I actually think it's the prophet is the one that brings correction to the church. I think the prophet is the one that's constantly seeing what heaven is doing and communicating that to the church. The gift of prophecy never corrects. Ever. Ever. Right? The gift of prophecy is for your encouragement, your edification. Right? That, that, that's what it's for. It's, it's supposed to be. Well, I don't want any of those, like, encouraging words. Okay, I, I, you don't want prophecy then. Right? But especially when, it, when our job as a prophetic community is actually to encourage the hell out of the region. Right? Like, that's kind of our real role. Like, our role is actually to encourage the hell out of people. I mean, I've never woken up one morning and said, I've had enough encouragement for the day. I don't need any more. Right? This is actually the, the, the gift of prophecy is for this encouragement, edification, building up, and comfort. That's the gift of prophecy. It should comfort, not thus saith the Lord, lust. You know, please. You can just throw that word around anywhere and you'll, 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 someone will feel guilty. So, but the prophet can come in and actually adjust. The prophet can come in and say, hey, this needs to shift. This, this culture needs to change. This is what you're going after, and the Lord would say this to you. And I think prophets can correct. That's kind of one of the distinguishing marks of a prophet is that they're the ones that are allowed to bring correction. Gift of prophecy, never. The prophet Pretty much always. Now, my wife is absolutely 125% a prophet. And other prophets that we run with say that Rachel is a, is a prophet of love. But that's, the, that's her mark. There are people that are prophets of joy because that's who, what they're bringing. Rachel is this prophet of love. You cannot be around my wife without thinking she loves you. Now, that's resulted in some creepy stalkers over the years, to be honest. <laughs> and there have been women stalking my wife, like coming into our house when we're not there. I knew. But she just exudes this love thing. She just, everybody knows their love. She's the prophet of love. So when she's bringing correction, you still feel loved. You still feel like, no, oh, wait a minute. What just happened? Because this isn't an excuse for bad behavior. Calling yourself a prophet isn't an excuse for bad behavior or being a scary individual or not doing relationships well. In fact, prophets, we, we raise up companies of prophets. Um, we're raising, we've raised one up in Chicago. We're raising one up in San Diego at the minute. Uh, this prophetic company. that is both prophets and highly gifted prophetic people. And it's really important that prophets do not run on their own. And you've got this whole 30-year history of people saying, I'm a prophet, and it's because you don't recognize me as a prophet, that's what makes me a prophet. Like this rejection thing that they're carrying as, as you know, a medal, a badge of honor, people reject me, therefore I'm a prophet, that's wrong. What happens when prophets are on their own is they get depressed, go live in a cave, or else they call out bears to kill children. Sorry, that's in the Old Testament. When they're running alone, they get really crazy. And in the Old Testament model, you had schools of prophets that would gather and they would walk and they would, you know, work on their prophetic word together that they were going to deliver to a nation or a king or someone important, and they would craft this together, whereas the model we have is a rejected lone prophet who's bitter and angry and everybody's afraid of her or him. It's not, it's not the model. That says nothing about the character of Jesus whatsoever, that he's giving you this burden that you can't bear. That's not a gift. And then you have the apostle. And the common teaching is that it's a secular term and that we are actually the top of the pile. We are large and in charge. 
That's not true. So apostles existed in the Sanhedrin. There was an office. So, that, so the, do you know what the Sanhedrin is? You all know? Anybody not know? Give you a quick. They were basically like there was a central Sanhedrin, the Grand Sanhedrin, and then every little town or municipality, municipality had a local Sanhedrin. So in the central Sanhedrin, you had a hierarchy of who was in charge, and they would come together every day from something like 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock or noon to 8, I can't remember, and they would discuss the law and matters of importance. They were basically a council uh, running the show um, under Roman govern governance. So these were the, they, they were in charge of their people under Ro Roman governance. The, the top dogs in the Sanhedrin were called the patriarchs, and they were the fathers, really, of, of the city. The, you know, it comes from the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and they kind of took the role as being the older father, wise men, and they were all men. Directly below them were the apostles in the Sanhedrin. And I don't know why, I, I don't know why people haven't discovered this. Because the teaching out there is wrong. Do you know what their job was? Their job was to interpret matters of the law, but their number one role was collecting the temple tax. Their number one role was to bring money into the temple. So you get these teenagers who say, hey, you're my apostles. They immediately think they've just been given the authority to interpret law, the law, and they're going to get rich. They're going to actually go and collect the money. In fact, Josephus, this historian, he talks about the temple tax being collected during Jesus' time and said that it took an army of 10,000 and they weren't. They, they used they used mercenaries. They used a paid army. It took an army of ten thousand to bring all the temple tax into the temple. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Going around all the nation and collecting, you know, your drachma or whatever it was at the time. And Jesus is saying to these guys, "Hey, you're going to have authority, and you're going to." be responsible for the finances. So that makes things a little bit more sensible whenever they come and lay the money at the apostles' feet. Right? There's a context for that. And even the context of the apostles in the Sanhedrin had some uh, context in the Old Testament. There's a guy called Robert Henderson who's written a book on it called The Cause, well, not on it. Uh, he's written a book called The Cause Blessing, which is about the teruma, the first fruits, and how it should go to your apostle. And, you know, he ties it in with the sort of priests in the Old Testament and how there's, there's this legacy that this isn't something that just happened out of context. There is a context for the role of the apostle. They would have fully understood what an apostle was. You have authority, and you can bring breakthrough with finance for the temple. Crazy. Whereas we have it that the apostle is the guy on stage at a conference um, in a nice suit going Shabbat. And is writing books and has a TV channel. Or nowadays it's a YouTube channel, right? And that's, that's what an apostle is. And we've made it on, out, of, out of reach and out of touch from average people like me. So here's the major, the major difference between Ephesians 4 gifts and Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Right? So if I pick in the Holy Spirit's gifts for a while, so should have bought a Honda, bought a, bought a Kia, right? It's, it's something that I do. The gift of tongues is something that I do. Prophecy, the gift of prophecy is something that I do. Right? It's the word of knowledge, something that I do. If I have the gift of faith, it's something that I have to do. You can't just have the gift of faith and sit back and do nothing, right? Because that would be stupid. So the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are things that we do. And the Spirit is always subject unto man, so we can make a choice to do or not do. There is no try, only do or not do. Yoda. <laughs> 
Um, Ephesians 4 aren't like that. Ephesians 4, the gift is the person. My shoes are creaking. I'm actually the gift. It's not my ability to juggle or spin plates. I am the gift. As an apostle, I am the gift. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Things should happen just because I'm here. Right? Things should shift just because I'm here. And there might be agitation, and there might be some pushback, and there might be a bunch of that, and there might be people getting tweaked a little bit, but things should happen because I am the gift. It's the same with the teacher. The teacher shows up. She or he is the gift. Not their, not their amazing abilities, just this. You know, if you receive a prophet in the name of the prophet, what do you get? The prophet's reward. If you, and I think it's applicable to, to all five. If you receive a teacher, in it, so if you're, if you're receiving me, an apostle, and you start to receive me as a pastor, you're going to get nothing but confusion. Anybody ever needed electrical work, f you know, fixed in their home, and, and they call a plumber? It wouldn't work. I'm not calling the plumber to come and fix my electrics. It'd be a disaster. It's the same with the fivefold. You don't call a prophet if you need an apostle. And people will say, hey, is it important that you call me apostle? Please don't call me apostle. Don't call me pastor. My name is good enough for my parents. It's good enough for everybody else. My name is Ian, and it means John, which is beloved. I'm okay with that. <laughs> right? My name's just Ian. But if you're actually looking for a function, then, then you should, and you need an apostle, you should call an apostle. Right? If you, if you need a prophet to come in and bring correction and adjustment, then you should call a prophet. You need a teacher, pastor, all that. Now, there is no model, so I'm the gift, right? I am the gift. It's one of the hardest things for people when, so when I'm, I do these emerging apostles intensives, and they're phenomenal. They're absolute, they're probably my favorite, well, it's hard to say. I love what I do, so I love what I do, and these are, these are up there with, some of the things I do, because I get to see people deployed as apostles, not just attend a school. I'm, I'm, I put everything I can to see them deployed as apostles. And it's the hardest thing for people to grasp is, but I'm the gift? So, so you're not, you know, if we're taking an offering, like we took an offering last night, and you're t I, I could sit there and say, I hope this is worth it. Like, I hope this is worth the, you know, the $7.50 they put in for whatever. I hope, I hope I'm worth it. I hope my abilities, my gifts worth it. I have to make sure I give them something. You know, it could dance for you, <laughs> juggle, you know, stay, you know, take some glitter from a pocket and throw it on you and make you think you've had an encounter. Because I'm under pressure that my gift has to be good enough. But when it's you, it's 10 times worse. It's 10 times worse. The vulnerability that there is in saying, hey, I'm the gift, is what everybody in our schools experience, whether they're prophets or apostles. The vulnerability of saying, okay, I'm the gift, well, that's freeing and terrifying. That's why it's the great and terrible day of the Lord, right? It's great and terrible. So it's both freeing to say, okay, great, I don't have to, but oh, wait a minute. What if nobody likes me? What if nothing changes? Then I'm probably not an apostle. And I need to go back to whatever I'm doing. But I'm the gift. Now, there is no model in the, in the New Testament of every church having fivefold present. That's one, of the, that's one of the things, particularly in smaller churches, believe it or not, you'll go in, I'll go into a church and you know, they'll call me or something like that. They'll hear about it and say, hey, you know, we're a church of 40 people and uh, we're really going to go after this fivefold, so um, who should we pick? And the, and the way it goes is, um, okay, so you're a prophet. 
your pastor, your teacher, you're an evangelist. Now, what does that leave? I guess I must be the apostle. Awesome. Well, let's do that, right? And that's how it went. There's no, there's no need for that. I think every church, regardless of whether they're led by an apostle, should be connected. And I mean connected to an apostle. See, the word apostolic means I look like my apostle. So if you tell me you're apostolic, I'll say, well, who's your apostle? And if you tell me it's Randy Clark, I'm going to say, no, it's not. It's not. Call him for me right now. Call him. If he's your apostle, or if he's your, if he's your apostle, call him. Let's see if he'll take your call. Even text him. You know, you don't have, nobody likes getting phone calls nowadays. Just text him and see if he'll reply. Well, I don't have his number, but I watch him a lot on YouTube. No, not your apostle. The, the apostle Paul says, you have many teachers, but you've one father. Now, that's not an encouragement to go out and get many fathers, nor is it an encouragement to not have many teachers. It's okay to have many teachers. In fact, if you're... If, as long as you're not brain dead, it's a good idea to have a lot of input and get a lot of thinking done and all that. But you've one father. No, you look like me, is what he says. He says it like five times, I think, in the New Testament. I want you to look like me. Imitate me. Do the same as I do. I'm going to send you Timothy, and Timothy will remind you of, of what I what I look like. And I want you to imitate Timothy because when you're imitating Timothy, you're going to imitate me. So you should be connected. Churches, individuals, eh, individuals should really be connected with the overseer of their church. But I think churches need to be connected to an apostle in that way. They actually are apostolic. And how do they become apostolic? We're actually going through this in, in a region that I won't mention because we're being recorded. But we're going through this in a region at the minute and trying to bring alignment in, into the picture. So alignment is kind of what the fivefold are about. And it's really the apostle and the prophet that drive it. And it's the pastor, teacher, evangelist that, that provide backup to this alignment. Because the Ephesians 4 word equipping is actually a Greek word that is a chiropractic term. And it means reset the bones. Anybody ever have to get their bone reset? Anybody broken their nose and reset it themselves? I did that once. Not fun. Right? It's sore. Bringing this alignment is sore. Wait, I have to change? I'm, I'm doing something that isn't just reinforcing everything I believe? Well, that's, that's not okay. Well, I only need Jesus. You know, that was around in Paul's time as well. Because, you know, some said they're Paul, some said they're of Apollos, some said they're of Peter, and some said they're just of Jesus. Right? So there's, there are people that were doing that at the time. That, that doesn't mean that apostles aren't a good idea. But our job is actually to come in and bring this alignment, this correction. Your posture's off. This is going to sting. And, and again, people think, well, that was, that was a great conference because I didn't have to change. That was amazing. That was an amazing evening because I didn't have to change a thing about myself. That's not apostolic. That's not fivefold. That's tickling your ears. That's getting someone with a real prophetic gift coming in to encourage the hell out of everybody. That's amazing. And we should keep doing that. But when you bring the fivefold in, it will be adjusting. And you will have to make decisions. Particularly if you're bringing an apostle or prophet in, you will, you will be confronted with, okay, are, are we going to do this or are we not going to do this? Are we going to actually change some of the things or are we just going to keep going? So when I say things like what got you here will not get you there, what, what do you think that requires? Yeah? Man, we love change. I mean, this computer... So I have a little skin on this computer because if I took the skin off, you'd be disgusted at how beaten up and battered the computer is. Scratches everywhere. This computer's seven years old. I don't want to change it. 
because I have to go through all the stuff and setting. I just, I don't want to change it. Right? I don't have to go through all that. Someone said, well, maybe one of your children could do it for you. No, then I'd have to tell them what I want. I'd have to figure that out, and then I wouldn't know how to, no. I just don't like change. But it's absolutely essential if we're going to be an apostolic community. If we're going to be an apostolic community, it's absolutely essential to get used to, you get used to change. Because what apostles do, so when apostles are just left on their own, everybody gets burnt out. The entire congregation are burnt out because apostles are like, let's go. We're going to build this. We're going to build this, okay? Okay, that was, that was last week. Then we're going to build this. What about that? Are we going, I'm, I'm not into maintenance. I don't do maintenance that well. So I hope you're all good over there. What, what's that? You, you have a broken leg? Bummer. Let's go. Or you have a broken leg? It, this is how it would, you have a broken leg? Jesus name. Wasn't fixed? All right, well, we're, we'll be over here just whenever you're ready. Catch up. Because what, what we're trying to do is we're, we're, we're trying to build. Apostles are obsessed with building. And my wife would say the number one trait of an apostle is they just don't stop. They don't quit. They're just never going to quit. Right? And I might do some of this tomorrow morning. It's like the apostle Paul said, I'm just not quitting. Been shipwrecked, stoned, not quitting. Because we just want to keep going. We have to keep building. We're going to build. We're going to build. And people say, well, you're not, you're not very pastoral. Of course I'm not. You can't, you can't receive me as an apostle, and you can't receive an apostle in the name of a pastor. It's impossible. But we need then other people around us that are kind of manifesting some of those gifts. And the unique thing about apostles so let, let me just say, so apostles, I'm, I'm going to dig into the prophets here. I'm going to give them a little dig. So apostles are like this. We're going to go after. We're just going to keep going, keep going. And I think apostles always need a prophet, at least one prophet in their life to, to keep them on the straight and narrow. But they also need someone who's really into heart health. Like really, they really need someone who's a pastor that wants to make sure people's needs are getting met. And that's why it's important to, to run with them. But um, So churches that are led by an apostle are frequently just, everybody's going, oh, that was a powerful service. Woo. Woo. This is why I come. Oh, that's great. Wait, we're doing what? I thought we were doing the other, we're not doing the other thing. Okay, okay, we're going to do this now. Okay, all right. And they get a little bit confused and battle fatigue, worn out. But the services are generally amazing. Like the worship is generally amazing and preaching is generally amazing. It's great. There's a power thing. It's great. This is why we come. Now when a prophet is leading a church, what happens is that they start a church and they gather like 40 people because they're all prophetic. Whoa, shabba, whoa, hell. Right? <laughs> I do that really well. Don't I? <laughs> and... And, you know, the, the, this prophet is leading a church, and they've got this prophetic company with them, and all they want to do is, like, worship for three hours, right? They just, well, you know, the Holy Spirit's moving. We're not going to have any teaching. We're not going to do it. We're just going to, like, move with the Spirit, and we're just going to be here. Oh, worship's amazing, incredible. Uh, we don't really know how to, you know, raise up worship teams, so we're just going to do a bunch of YouTube videos every week because the quality is actually amazing. And we can't compete with that quality, but we're just going to, what's the longest worship song on YouTube? We're going to put it up there. Um, we're just going to go after it. We're going to worship. Um, we're going to have manifestation. Oh, and I see the Lord doing this. And before too long, you've got eight people in the church. But they're the most intense eight people in the church that you'll ever meet. And they call themselves, you know, Church of Church of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Like they come up with these super prophetic religious names that are not des that are designed to repel anybody that wants to belong to it. 
That's what happens. Prophets. And when the prophet isn't connected with an apostle, they'll stay like that. But it's the apostle that kind of comes in and said, hey, let me help you build. Let, I just want to worship. I know you just want to worship and hear God and correct everybody. I know you want to do that, but let's, let's try and build something. We'll build something together. That's why they're the foundations of the church. And what's happened in almost every region, in almost every country that I know of, is that there has been an old foundation. And that foundation has generally been on the pastor and teacher. And it's, it's a flawed foundation. It will not sustain the weight of glory that God wants to pour out on the earth in any region or city or anything. So, that means, strategically, the job of an apostolic community is to build a new foundation. That's your job. It's not rocket science. It is to raise up apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. That's the job. But particularly focused on the apostles and prophets. Because they're the they will be the new foundation for whatever God wants to do here. <coughs> the, the unique attribute of an apostle is that we have the ability... We have, the, we have the ability to actually uh, raise up the other four of the fivefold. Well, we have the ability to reproduce not just according to kind. So prophets will reproduce prophets. Pastors will reproduce pastors, right? Apostles will reproduce apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. It's, it's why they were called first. First does not mean rank. First means chronological. So the first thing you do is actually raise up apostles. And once they're real apostles and they're, they start apostling, one of the first things they'll do in apostling is actually raise up the other four. And they might be intentional about it or it can just happen. Now, again, the problem is when you're led by an apostle, everybody thinks they're an apostle. So we had a church. We stepped down from the church two and a half years ago. Uh, we did this survey by, by a friend of mine to see what your fivefold gifting was, and I immediately thought it was a lot of nonsense, to be honest, But because um, it talks about apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, and all that rather than the actual fivefold. But um, all our leaders did this test, and they all came out, all of them except two about 50, 60 leaders in our church. And they all come out as apostolic. Because when you're around an apostle, you're going to feel like you're an apostle. It's one of the biggest challenges, actually, to raising up apostles is that people that are led by an apostle, they all think they're apostles. And then someone will go through my school and realize, oh, no, I'm not an apostle. Because we look at it like, you know, you've, we're, going to have the, we're going to have the apostle ordination bring your shofars and your prayer shawls and we're going to install formerly the artist formerly known as Pastor and we're going to install Andy now as the apostle and we make pomp and ceremony out of it. When what Jesus is doing with the disciples is saying, hey, you're all going to die. I'm about to call you to something that is effectively a death sentence for you. So who wants to be an apostle? <laughs> right? Why would you want to do this? Why would you even want to pretend you're an apostle? Because honestly, it is a death sentence. It is something. Like I, I feel apostles should be the chief foot washers in any community. That, that we're not here to be served. We're here to serve. We, we, are, we are here to make sure the church is all that she can be. And we want to serve. That's the heart of an apostle. In fact, Brian Simmons, who, who, write, who translated the, the Bible, in, or the New Testament Psalms and a couple of the other ones, Genesis and Isaiah he has out at the minute, he translates one of the scriptures about apostles to say that we are the chief 
under rowers of the ship. That we're not even on top of the ship telling people where to go. We're just underneath the deck using all of the authority we have to get the ship where it needs to go. That's what we do. And instead, we've made it into this thing. So I go to churches, and the apostle, who's generally the retired pastor, and the apostle sits on the apostle's chair. And the minute the, 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 the pastor will say something a little bit con controversial, uh, the entire congregation looks at the apostle who gives his blessing. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I go to a church, I'm not even the apostle of the church. It's the church we pastored for years. I'm not even their apostle. Because that would get very confusing for our people. Because, you know, the new leaders need to lead. And if people keep looking over to me or Rachel to see if we approve of their leadership, then they won't be able to lead. So even in that role, as an apostle, you step back and say, further, far, you know, further than we could ever have taken it. Go to places we would never have taken the church. This is my job as a servant. But we get it upside down. And part of the reason we get it upside down is the authority thing. But I'll stop there. And if anybody's any questions, I understand with questions there's an awkward silence and you haven't thought about questions. So this is how I deal with questions. Not my first rodeo. I'm going to count down from five, and when I get to zero, I will assume there are no questions. So you've got this small window of opportunity to ask me anything. All right? I see that hand. When you were talking about the Sanhedrin, yeah. it is in... In, is there a Roman, did they mix it, like Roman views with Hebrew views? Do you understand? No, no. no. Okay. There, there so, was, so this was part of, were you here last night? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was part of Second Temple Judaism that they created. Because the presence had gone from the temple, they thought that they should just do a bunch of, they came up with um, system structures, that they thought would facilitate the presence coming back. And one of those was the Sanhedrin. It was effectively a tool um, that the Jewish people used to remain semi-autonomous under um, occupation so that they could still interpret the law and not have Roman interference. There's a whole bunch more to that Second Temple stuff. But What is the best way to be a bridge to other churches that do not have an apostle? Apostle. So, <laughs> so the easiest thing is to happen. Like the the most, there's no can like I I don't want to. Um, I don't I don't want to try and usurp any overseer of a local church. So the authority thing we'll we'll touch on we'll touch on a little bit in the next hour. But the authority of this church, say Andy decides, you know what, Ian, you are the apostle of this church. Right? Say Andy was to make that announcement tomorrow morning. And you're all, you know, there's a million dollar joining fee, so just, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> so say he was to do that, um, that, that would bring a little shift, right? That would bring a little. But if he's to do that, do you know who's in charge of the, do you know who becomes in charge of this church? Him. He's still the overseer of the church. Apostles appointed the overseers of the church and then the overseer of the church related to an apostle and who they related to changed. So I would have no intention of going into any other church and trying to undermine the values of that church, even if they're not fivefold. But the one thing you can do is be attractive. So you, you, can, you can actually have, so I have a, I have a church in Ohio and there are social service agencies are going, what is going on in that church? Other churches are starting to say, 
what is going on in that church? And the lo local guys are saying, well, this is what's going on. Um, I have testimonies, you know, there is not one of my churches that has not um, had to deal, they, they've all had to deal with learning to be financially abundant. So literally going from, hey, I don't know how we're going to make ends meet this month, living month to month as a church, to, okay, so what does it look like when you have 100 grand in the bank account? Is that, are we not stewarding this well? Are we, and having to walk through what it looks like. To, and, and of course, then other churches and ministries even are going, what are you doing? You're starting to give away 25 grand to this and this and this. What? What's going on? Well, this is what's going on. We are an apostolic church, and part of the apostolic breakthrough is financial. Just is. Um, so you become attractive, and then, you know, you create some little vibe. But again, it should never be manipulative or anything like that. So I think what happens is you grow. You grow in, might, you might not even grow numerically, but you grow in impact. Your impact increases, um, exponentially increases. Uh, because the, you know, the, if I use the anointing thing, so the anointing flows down. It doesn't go up. And the most oil that there ever is on, you know, if you picture Aaron getting anointed, where, where is the most oil? Here. It all drips down. Like the river of God is narrowest and shallowest at the gates of the temple. There's something about the kingdom that it increases as you as you as you move further up. So, I think the increased stuff. I think all of that happens. The com you you increase in complexity even because if uh, so if, you know the apostle starts to come up, the prophets coming up, the pastor, teacher, evangelist, they're all out there in the wings, and everybody thinks they can do anything. So one of one of the things that's on my life is that. I hope if you spend any time with me, you think you're you can achieve anything. You have the courage to actually do the stuff that's on your heart to do, and you believe that you're worth it, not worthless. You believe that God didn't die for worms. He died for sons and daughters. And there is no good father that doesn't want their son and daughter to be blessed in every single possible way. That's the real way to have a health and wealth discussion. What does a good father want? For his, for his children. So my hope is that you do that. Um, but that then increases complexity because then you have people saying, well, I, I want to do something with sex trafficking. And, you know, I have this real heart and burden for, for this. And I've, and then you get really complex and you, you're going to need an administrator to come in from Romans 12 and say, help, help. Because we want to build. We want to keep building. So hope that helps. Long answer. Another question? I know um, this Pastor Andy just says that God will meet the body, the people that are gods, that are seekers, and they're they're going to meet. He's going to meet them in every church and all that, right? I mean, but as as the kingdom keeps, is there going to be a a line that says this is the kingdom? Do you understand? It's just. What I'm saying is the kingdom keeps expanding and we keep growing under the apostolic fivefold, the bodies, the people that seek God. And God will always, what I'm asking is the ones that never understand it, they'll just keep going? Or how does that work in the kingdom of God? The ones that maybe don't align with it or is that not our place to w wonder about. I, yeah, I, I think it's very natural to ask that. You know, I think of Peter, um, you know, where, where Jesus does this remarkable restoration with Peter. Um, so when Peter said, I'm going fishing, he wasn't saying, let's go fishing. He's saying, 
I'm going back to the family business because I have failed at being a disciple of a rabbi. He said, I've blown it. This is over. And most of the uh, disciples went with, most of the apostles went with him because they all thought they'd blown it for some reason. Peter's pretty obvious. And then Jesus does this marvelous restoration. There's more to that story. Jesus does this marvelous restoration um, in front of another campfire where he said, and he, I mean, Peter said, I have no effing thing to do with that effing man. Like, this wasn't a, oh, I don't know him. He was, like, swearing that he didn't know Jesus. And Jesus restores him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? What's Peter's first response? What are you going to do with John? What are you going to do with him? What about him? And Jesus' response was, what is it to you if I let him live until I come back? Don't worry about that. You do what you're called to do, and let me deal with John. And I think that's, that allows me to be gracious and merciful to anybody that's different. Anybody that even rejects the stuff that I believe and, and hold, I, I'm not an evangelist to them. You know, I'm, I'm not an evangelist, but I'm not trying to evangelize them into, into my belief system. I think, I think the church has been feeding from the wrong tree. So we've been feeding from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one we're not supposed to touch, right? We're supposed to be at the tree of life. And I think feeding from the tree of life is kind of really important. Everybody's really good at telling you what you believe is wrong and why it should be changed and all that. I think part of the kingdom call is to say, not a tree I'm going to feed from. I'm going to I'm going to go over to this life tree. And I'm not saying doctrine or theology doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying don't feed on that, especially when it comes to relationships. So let Jesus deal with John. All right. Let's take 15 minutes. Yep. So 15-minute break, so come out back in 15 minutes. <laughs> so let's continue. Amen. Are you guys learning stuff? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So let's continue. So come on. All righty. I have a I have a 22 year old son who's incredibly handsome and he's single. Just in case anybody's interested, <laughs> he, he, he goes to uh, he goes to university in St Andrews in Scotland, which is where Prince William met Kate, uh, and he's going to his first ball tonight. So, his his uh, his New Testament theology teacher is a gentleman called N.T. Wright. Uh, if you know who N.T. Wright is, that's his. Yeah. All right. So we'll do do Q and A uh, towards the end. We finish at four, yeah. Yeah. So I'll try to stop pretty early. So apostles, what do apostles do? They correct churches, not just their own church. So if an apostle is an apostle over only one church, they're not an, an apostle. They're the overseer of that church. All right. Now they may have, they may be an apostle somewhere else. So say I'm going to pick on Andy. Say Andy is an apostle, and he is having no other influence in any other church in the region than he's simply the overseer of this church. If he does have influence in other churches, be it in Zimbabwe, then he's an apostle in Zimbabwe. But here he's the overseer. Now he's still an apostle, but that's his function here as the overseer of the church. Um, so is that clear? All right. So that's that's why I think every church needs to be connected with an outside apostle. So let me tell you some of the things that I do. Um, I, if if a church says, okay, uh, we'd like you to be our apostle, um, I I look at it as a, as a spectrum, and I teach this at my emerging apostle stuff. I, I look at it as a spectrum. Some people will bring me in once a year, just to talk about angels. Say, it's great. I'll do that forever. 
right? I lo love doing it, and that's it. That's their connection, and that's them pulling or drawing on me as an apostle. Right the way through to some churches, I'm on their board. Um, I set the senior pastor, the, the overseer, the senior leader of the church, I set their salary and benefits package because when the apostle does it, you remove politics, poverty, and the fear of man. Should never be a board deciding what the senior leader, ever. Nor should it be the senior leader deciding what their benefits should be. It should be the apostle who can, there's no poverty, no politics, and there's no fear of man. What are they gonna think if you're driving a Cadillac? I don't care. You're welcome. Right? And you can blame me. Well, I don't set it. You know, it's that guy. <laughs> Great. Because I honestly believe that what I get, you'll get. I believe what Andy gets, you'll get. So I think that's the kingdom thing. It's the anointing runs down. It doesn't run up, you know. If, uh, you know, some churches have gone to extremes with it. And, you know, I, I think there's... You know, the, one of the things that Paul, so here we are. I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick on, on to, cause time. <laughs> so um, so I set the salaries. I, ha I also, if I'm on their board, I have a binding resolution on any conflict. So if the board are arguing with the church and they're arguing with the senior leader and he or she's arguing with the board of the church and they can't, they reach an impasse, then it's, hey, now, I will have known about this, and I'll come in and say, boom. This is the decision. This is the way. Again, Mandalorian reference. I can't get it out of my head for some reason. But, right? But this is actually, this is what we're going to do. So, and this is why we're going to do it, and how can I help you? But you three need to leave. You're toxic, you need to leave. And that means then that even the senior leader is shielded from any accusation. Because I'm going to use my authority to protect what God is building. So that, that, and then I'll come in twice, three times a year and just speak to their board, train that, see, most boards aren't even trained how to be a board. Like most people are, hey, would you be part of my board? Sure, what does it mean? Don't really know. We kind of meet every other month and sort of talk about money. So some sometimes I'll go and actually work with their boards and say, hey, this is what you should be doing. Have you thought of this? Blah, 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 blah. And it can be anywhere in that spectrum, right? Now, one of, one of the things that, so I'm in, the, in this spectrum, what I'm doing, if at this end of it, what I'm doing, and actually even at this end, I'm using the authority that is the mark of the apostle. The mark of an apostle is that they're raising up the fivefold. The other mark of an apostle is that you should feel the authority they carry. Now, people confuse that with leadership. Just because I have the authority doesn't mean I'm the leader. I'm not the leader of the five-fold pack. Like, that's not what apostles are. We're the chief under oars. I'm going to put all of my weight to make sure that this ship gets to where it's going. And the captain of the ship isn't even the senior leader. It's Jesus himself, our first apostle, our great and high apostle. Right? But... He's, he, he chooses to work a certain way, which is through local church overseers, and I'm going to put all everything I have behind this to bring some correction. So one of our regions at the minute is going through this whole alignment thing. And what you've got is you've got all these ministers, so people that are doing ministry, and they're itinerating and doing whatever, and you've got leaders of churches and leaders of ministries who are pastors or mercy or they're prophetically gifted, but they're leading this thing, and they're all running around like the sky is falling. Meanwhile, the apostle's going, we're, we're doing this. Well, who gives you the right to do that? This is what we're doing. Because Jesus' model of leadership, but Jesus' model of being an apostle or even being a rabbi 
was not to coerce people or convince them to do what he was doing. He just went up and said, follow me. That, that's what we do. I'm not going to try and give you a benefits package. I'm just going to say, hey, this is what apostles do. We're, we're doing this. We're going here. Who's, we're going here. Who's with me? Anyone? Anyone coming? I'm, I'm going to go and see the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, people raised from the dead. I'm going to break the poverty spirit over this region. Who's with me? I want to break the poverty spirit over the region. Shall we do that? Yeah, let's do that. You want to break the witch, witchcraft that's on this region? Do you want to do that? That would be fun. That would be a lot of fun, to be quite honest. Because, because you know, you know what? Do you know, like apostles are actually built for war. We're not built for peacetime. So the problem is, if it's peacetime, we're going to create a bit of a conflict. <laughs> you know, we just like a good fight. It's not just the Irish in me. It's the it's the grace that's on my life. Right? We just like a good fight. And hey, we're, we're, we're anyone with me? We're going to kick some devil butt. Come, let's go. Let's go. That's what apostles do. And meanwhile, all the people that are getting upset because what in the process of doing this, what you're doing is actually creating alignment. You're bringing everybody in. You're moving forward. You're bringing everybody in, and they're going to be aligned with you, not behind you. They're going to be aligned with you. And we just have the ability to fight and not quit. And you get knocked down and you, you're going to go, oh, that's stung. I need to go and talk to my pastor. <laughs> it was really hard. Okay, I'll go back in the fight now. That's what, that's what we do. So it's the, the, like the mark of the apostle is that they're going to reproduce the other five. So if you think someone's an apostle, Ask yourself the question, have they reproduced the other five? Are they even reproducing other apostles? Because that's kind of the mark of an apostolic movement is that there are other apostles. Not just ministers. Not just itinerants. Ask yourself, are they raising up the other five? And ask yourself, hey, hey are they, do they seem to have authority? Or do they just have it tattooed on their arm like I do? Are they walking in this exousia? So, see the the, you know. So that those are kind of two big marks. The other one is their model Christians. Imitate me. I I can't say that if I'm if my marriage is wrecked. It's really hard. You know, I, I, have, I have the best marriage that I know of. I have never looked at anybody else's marriage and thought, wow, I wish that was ours. Ever. We are deliriously happy. And we have to fight for that. Right? We, ha we have to actually battle for, you know, my wife being the most important person in my life. We t tell our kids, hey, you're not the most important people in their life. Your mom's the most important person in my life. I'm sorry, but I, I took a, a vow that I would forsake everybody else, including you three, for the sake of this woman. We have some boundaries in our, in our marriage, you know, so we never talk about money after 9 o'clock at night. We've actually shrunk it back. It's now getting closer to 3.30 in the afternoon. But <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you know, because we're not going to talk about anything stressful. We have never called each other, a, like, stupid. We have never called each other, like, anything personal insult. We, we made that boundary really early on. She is the only woman I've ever dated, ever. God told me I would marry her when I was 16 years old and I would have to wait seven years for her. And seven years and three weeks later, we started dating. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. That's not the model. That's the exception. That's not the rule. All right? But, so when I'm saying, follow me, I, I better have something to follow. Imitate me. I, I better have something that's worth imitating. You know, and that's not that I'm perfect in every area. Please, this is not. I just, you should be a model. Like, your relationship with the Lord should be a model. 
you know, oh, I'm really struggling with shame at the minute. No, I'm not. Because I have a relationship with my father who would never want to shame me. Ever. So, guilt is a good thing. Shame is not a good thing. So this is kind of what apostles do. We influence churches. We bring alignment. We bring correction. We walk in authority. And people sense it. And we bring change. Now, you could say, well, what about the signs and wonders and miracles stuff? I actually think every Christian should be walking in signs and wonders and miracles, not just apostles. But I do think apostles, can, I, one of my favorite uh, portions of Scripture is Acts 19, where, where the apostle Paul gets sent out, and he's, he's apostling, and he goes to this synagogue, and he starts to teach in this synagogue, and the synagogue kick him out. So then he goes to this school of Tyrannus, and he starts to this school of supernatural ministry. It's not what it's called in the Bible, but that's what he does. He, he has this discipleship supernatural ministry school. And it says within two years, all of Asia Minor was, was gospel. That, that all her, everyone in Asia Minor, which is all of that vast place of Turkey and all around it, had heard the gospel because of one ministry school. But it's not just the ministry school. It says that Paul did extraordinary powers. The word isn't miracles. The word is dunamis. Extraordinary powers. You ever think what they are? I'll have to save that for another time. No, we can't save it for another time. Like... Everything the enemy does is, is a counterfeit, right? So when you see people, I w went to northern India one time, and we uh, landed doing vineyard worship conferences the day after uh, this group of monks had been in the area. We arrived in the auditorium that the monks had been in. We were doing a worship conference, and we're told stories of how they were levitating, like they're levitating. And they're teaching other people to levitate, and they're pulling people up with them as they're levitating. And we come in and we're come, now is the time to. And people are saying, "Well, what what have you got?" Uh, come, now is the time to. That's what we were saying. We were promoting that album, and it felt a bit powerless. Now, levitating is just a counterfeit. It's just it's actually just a manifestation of the spirit realm, to be honest. It's not even a counterfeit. It's just a manifestation that happens in the spirit realm. So we, we get our panties in a bunch when glitter appears. Or there's feathers. We're like, I don't really understand it. Levitation, people. <laughs> like, you know, there's, have you ever heard, there's this place in, in France called Montmartre, which is the Mount of Martyrs. And the Protestants came in and killed a bunch of Catholics. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the Catholic priests that they killed, they beheaded him because uh, he wouldn't stop preaching the gospel. Because at that time, I don't know if you, you, you're familiar with this, but the Catholic Church was, was um, not always seen as like uh, the extremists within the Protestant community weren't super gospel-oriented. They were more anti-Catholic than they were gospel-oriented. And even within the Catholic Church, there were a lot of people still preaching the gospel. So they, they martyred this one guy, cut his head off. He wouldn't stop preaching the gospel. So his body got up, grabbed the head, and started to walk up Montmartre preaching the gospel. Whoa, that's wow. Crazy stuff. And then we read in Acts 19 that Paul did extraordinary powers. makes me happy. Like there's stuff about this just makes me happy. So so I, I think that there is something about the apostle that sort of moves in this extraordinary stuff. I also think this is my personal bias, but I, I think apostles are aligned with angels. Um and apostles get to direct angels. Because that's what John did in Revelation. To the angel of the church of tell them this. John gets the instructions from his chief apostle and then the apostle John commands the angel. 
no, I wouldn't make that a dogma, but I have found it more and more common that what happens is when apostles start to emerge that the angelic just switches on. It just turns on. And the things that you actually you've been battling with don't no longer have to happen. That apostles do have the ability to, so we went to do this mystical thing in, in Mexico and we had this secret garden to do some outdoor meditation and movement and all that kind of stuff. And uh, people are encountering God. They're having these dramatic encounters with God and they're meeting their angels for the first time and having conversations with their angels. It's incredible. Uh, but every day, for 45 minutes before we would meet, I would walk around the boundaries of the property saying, angelic guards. God, I want angelic guards. I want, the, I want help from Zion. I want your help from Zion. We're, do, we're doing this one day. There's three angels come in. These three angels come in. I'm like, okay. I don't like talking to angels in front of other people because you look like you're mentally ill or drawing attention to yourself rather than what God's doing. So I don't like it. So I give them all this exercise to do, and then two angels had flown off, and I went to the one big angel and said, well, can I help you? He says, no, we're just in the region. We're part of this region, and we just we knew something was happening. And Yeah, this is great. I'm like, okay, glad I have your permission. But part of that, I believe, was actually me going around and saying, okay, God, I want your angelic covering. I want the covering of the angelic here that, you know, I have, I have a promise in Scripture that no weapon that's formed against me will prosper. That, that, I believe, is a promise just for me. It might not be for you. I think it was written just for me. <laughs> it doesn't say there's no weapons formed against you. It just says they won't prosper, right? There are weapons formed against you. It's just they're not going to prosper. And actually, I think part of the apostolic grace is to come in and say, I think this is about the angelic stuff and going and doing all that. So we get our authority. Where do we get our authority? So I don't think I finished this thought last night. So the, the rabbinical authority came with two witnesses. So if you were going to be a rabbi with authority, there had to be two witnesses. And one of those had to be a rabbi with authority. So... Jesus was released as a rabbi with authority when there were two witnesses. The first one was a rabbi with authority called John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God, right? Whose sandals I'm not even worthy to, to tie. And the other voice came, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's actually some oral tradition that says that when, when uh, you know, if I'm coming to lay hands on, on this rabbi, that I would say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So the father does that. Jesus is asked, where do you get, where do you get your authority? Excuse me. Where do you get your authority and what does he say? Where does John get his authority? Well, who gave John his authority? They're like, no. Oh. Yeah. So we, we actually get our authority um, by someone laying hands on us and sending. So there are two models in the New Testament. There's a Jerusalem model and an Antioch model. So the Jerusalem model said this. Jerusalem model said uh, there are 12 now there are 11. We need to make it up to 12 again. And there is possibly some scripture to support that in the Old Testament. <coughs> um, possibly. Um, so they, they decide to make it up to 12. 12 is a very special number within Judaism. It's not the most special number. 10 is, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, Jews believed you, ancient Hebrews believed you had 10 centers in your body that were really significant for your health, wealth, and all that. So they made it up to, to 12. Who did they appoint? Anybody remember? Matthias, right? Who was the guy that they didn't appoint? His name is Justice. He has another name. I can't quite remember it, but Justice. So they cast lots. 
right? Not real Holy Spirit there. Sure <laughs> You know, if it's an even number, it's Matthias. If it's an odd number, it's justice. Okay, Matthias it is. The Lord has spoken. Like, there's no indication. There may be some indication that it would happen, but there's no indication that this is what should have happened. Like, this this will ruffle some of your feathers, so um, if you fully understand what I'm about to say. So the Jerusalem model, um, I don't believe is the model for the church. So what we have is we have non-church, non-local church entities giving people certificates of ordination. That is a flawed model. I I don't care if you're Bethel, Global Awakening, Harvest International Ministries, Catch the Fire, the River Network. I don't care what you are. That is not the New Testament model to get your authority. I have a piece of paper. That's all I have. Because what happened to Matthias? What great works did Matthias do in the rest of Scripture? None. Zip. The Orthodox Church keeps some records, and his is the shortest entry. We think he went here. Matthias. What did justice do? The guy who wasn't picked. He actually became part of an an integral part of the early church. His name comes up in Acts 15. He was the guy that delivered the uh, the message of the decision of the council that they had, the apostolic and overseers council on on the decision of whether you needed circumcised or needed to eat kosher and all that. He it was justice that delivered the message. Justice appears with influence. Matthias never appears and doesn't seem to have any influence. Which for me speaks of it's more important what you do when you're not picked than what you do when you are picked. It's more important what your heart does when you're not the chosen one. And then Matthias is this great model. He's not an apostle. He's one of the 12. <laughs> or Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> and and he's never heard of again. He certainly isn't running a network of churches with 13,000. He's certainly not doing conferences all over the world, Shaba writing books. He writes nothing for, the, for Scripture. I don't even think there's a gospel of Matthias. There's a, alleged gospels of a bunch of other people, but this guy's forgotten. And then you have, the, then James is killed. James is martyred which brings them down to 11. And they never have a conversation about bringing it up to 12 again. I think Matthias must have been such a disappointment to have not done it. They never have a conversation. In fact, the Jerusalem model is done. There are no more apostles within that model. The original 12 are there, and there's no real multiplication. They're not raising up other apostles and all of this. And there's... There are possibly 30-something apostles mentioned in the New Testament. And, you know, maybe one of them, maybe one of the unnamed ones is Matthias. I I don't know. But there are, let me see, I think I have it pulled up in my notes here. There are, yeah, there there are 23 named, and then there are, are four unnamed. And then there's an, there's some thought that Jude, who's the brother of Jesus, is possibly an apostle. Maybe Mark, the guy who wrote Mark, might have been an apostle. Luke might have been an apostle. Whoever wrote Hebrews might have been an apostle. And this brings us up to around 30. And there's even one verse, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about you know other apostles, other unnamed apostles. So there's a bunch of apostles. None of them come up through the Jerusalem model. You have the Antioch model, which is where the local church recognizes Paul, who had a who had a fivefold grace as a teacher, and Barnabas, whose name was not Barnabas, that was his nickname, because it means encourager. He he had he had either a strong prophetic gifting or he had a fivefold grace of the prophet on his life. And they recognized that this teacher and prophet had actually now received the grace of an apostle. So what they did was they laid hands on them on them, and sent them. 
continuing the tradition of this shmika for years and years and years, centuries, millennia, they continued the, the tradition of a transfer of authority. There is nowhere in Hebrew thinking that laying on of hands is just symbolic. So I'm, I was, I'm a vineyard guy, right? I was in the vineyard for years, and the vineyard was so laid back, we didn't even think we had to lay hands at times. So it'd be like, yo, shabalaba, right? No, laying on hands is not just symbolic. There is a transference. Last night when these guys with healing, you know, you, I do this sort of trying to expand your, uh, you know, your flow, your, your, your spiritual flow. Um, I do this exercise in this little mystical school that I do. And you, you can start to feel it. You can start to feel the flow even between each other if you're concentrating and intentional. Because one of my foundational values is that your life will always move in the direction of your intention. If you focus on the demonic, do you know, you know where your life's going to go? Right? So, so this, this, they continued the tradition, and then what happened is Paul and Barnabas now walk with the authority of their local church that has a millennia-old tradition of walking in authority. So what we have at the minute in the church is we have people who are just walking in their own authority. They are self-appointed, self-anointed, and think they don't need anybody else. Whereas it's actually the local church that is the, it, it is the seat of the authority. So our church recognizes Rachel and me, the church we pastored, we stepped down, they gathered us one night and they laid hands on us as an apostle and prophet and sent us sent us out. So I get to walk in all their authority. I get to walk in all the authority that, you know, the guy who actually ordained me in the vineyard, he was ordained by John Wimber. That's awesome, right? If Randy Clark has ever laid hands on you, Randy was ordained by the guy who ordained me. He was ordained by Wimber. That's awesome. I'd rather walk in that authority than just be independent and go it alone and think nobody, you know, nobody's having anything to, nobody's adjusting me. Because one of the things apostles have to do as well is be adjustable. I, I have to remain adjustable. I have to have someone in my life that can come in and adjust me. Frequently it's my, my wife. Right? And, and my wife says, hey, this doesn't work for me. This, this, this doesn't work for me because I, I need this. If you're going to have to do this or you're working with them, I need you to do it this way. Is that, is that important to you? Is the fact that I need you to do it this way important to you? And I get to decide whether it's important to you. So we have to be adjustable. And, and we have to have healthy relationships. This is, this is something... Super important. So let me read the let me read this list. Jesus is our first apostle. Peter, Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, another James, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas Iscariot, Matthias, Paul, Barnabas, Andronicus, uh, Junius, the chick the woman women apostles <laughs> well you know how revolutionary that was you know when you go back to some of the some of the orthodox churches teaching in the in early church history it's fascinating like the woman at the well De Jewish demonology said that wells you weren't allowed to go to a well or any open water alone so Jesus walking in the water alone is controversial not just the walking in water, but the fact that he's not with anybody. He was only with the disciples at the end because demons were said to infest open water. So you could never go to the well on your own. That was illegal. In fact, there's, there's one, of the, one of the rabbis with, with who, one of the rabbis, um, he cut a hole in his outside 
party that that's over uh, you know they used to build these over over running water uh, he built a hole in a hole in the wall so his wife could put her hand on his head when he was going to the bathroom because he did, just didn't want to be over the water just in case there were demons that would jump in right so you have this story of the woman at the well that takes on a whole new thing she's there on her own people would probably think she's demonized because she's at the well on her own in the middle of the day which is not what happened so this is a woman carrying all this shame from her entire society and according to some early church records she was the first church planter a woman first church planter she was martyred in Rome because she wouldn't she wouldn't in fact she was they were supposed to be like torturing her and the, the the story goes that she was just so full of joy that she was just laughing and drunk in the spirit the whole time they were torturing because she was she could see Jesus and she was with Jesus so Jesus was totally pro women James the Lord's brother Silas uh, Timothy Epaphroditus, Apollos, there's two unnamed in 2 Corinthians, and then there's a second two unnamed in 2 Corinthians. And then possibly Jude, Mark, Luke, whoever wrote Hebrews, Titus, and then in 1 Corinthians 15, some others. So there's a bunch of apostles. And we, we have this... Too many pastors are mentioned? Did you guess? I can't think of any. I could be wrong. I can't think of any. And yet we've made the senior pastor. Well, he's the pastor of the church. Like we're told, that's the old foundation. He is not the pastor of this church. He's the leader of this church, right? He is. He is the overseer, elder, shepherd, whatever you want to call him. But he's not the pastor. Shepherd is probably not a good word. That would confuse everything. He's not the pastor, right? He's. He's not. That's an old foundation. But he's the senior pastor. Now, we just use it because it's convenient and you don't have to teach everybody everything the minute they come out. Well, we don't use the term pastor because we're fivefold. You don't have to do that. But I, ch I, would, I wasn't called the senior pastor. I was called the senior leader of my church. Because if people wanted me to be a pastor, they would get really disappointed. Pastor never calls. Why would I call? You play golf. If you play golf, we'll call you and we'll go out and play golf. But if you shoot, you, yeah, we can go out, we can go out shooting. That's great, right? So it, it's kind of like changing everything. But what we have is we have the word pastor that appeared once in Ephesians four, and we have apostles coming out the wazoo. Did you not think there should be more apostles? There should be more apostles in the church than there are pastors. There should be more apostles in, there, in a church than there are the senior leader. And one of the shifts, because you have not been this way before, is the minute you start talking about an apostolic community, is you start to see apostles being raised up, and you're going, well, as the leader of a church, you're going, what do you do with these people? Like, okay, they can't all be speaking into the life of this church. Well, no, that's when we go into their metron. Where, where are they called to be? What's their area of influence, favor, all that? Where are they actually going to be apostles? And how can we help them get there. So I believe there should be more apostles. I, I'm, I can't say never, because never, never means never, and always never means always, right? So I'm going to use the word never. I never come across people that have so much ego that they think they're apostles. That isn't the problem with apostles. With prophets it is. There are people with so much ego and a misunderstanding of what a prophet is that they think they're a prophet. And, and that's a problem with, with the prophetic community is everybody's a prophet. Well, they're not. They're just a prophetically gifted person. Can we just honor that as being amazing? Um, but apostles, I never come across someone who's going, hey, I'm an apostle. You're welcome. Never. 
I think in my life I've maybe come across one guy who's like that. And actually, truthfully, I have a lot of grace for him because he had a stroke, and I think it affected how his brain is wired, and it's not, you know, I have a lot of grace and mercy for him. Um, I don't think he thought like that before he had this sort of attack on his brain. The, the problem is complete opposite with apostles. You kind of have to encourage them to go, no, listen, you're an apostle. Oh, I don't know. Oh, what are people going to think? Because that means I have to get the white magnet from a car and put it on. I have to get a business card printed and, you know, I have to do that. I just, oh, what are going to have to sit in the stage every... The reluctance for people to be apostles is off the charts in my experience. This is what I do. I raise up apostles. I have yet to walk into one of my schools and not have to make people understand more about what it is, but also feel comfortable in saying, I am an apostle. You know, I, I am an apostle. You know, even one of my guys who's, who was ministering in the Ukraine last week, and, you know, he's giving me some feedback and uh, of how things are going. And he, and he says, I think I'm finally emerging. I've been with this guy for nearly three years. And fine, it's the self-confidence thing. Do you have the confidence to think you're an apostle? If you're an apostle, the, the, we need you to be apostle. <laughs> we, need, we need you not to be full of this false humility nonsense. We need you to be apostle. We need you to start bringing the kingdom. We need you to start correcting other churches. We need you to bring alignment into churches. We need the angelic to be kind of released. We need your authority behind what we're going to do. The church needs your authority. And every time you're sitting, if that's you, every time you're sitting there saying, I don't know. I'm just waiting on like God to show me some more. You're robbing the church. You, you're a detriment to the church because God has called you to do something and because of some sense of ego, you're not embracing it and saying, okay. I can remember the first time getting up to people, getting up in front of people and saying, hey, I'm an apostle. <coughs> Sorry, what'd you say? I'm an apostle. And people say, Ian, do you think you're an apostle? Oh, other people have called me that. You know, it's not the way it's supposed to go. Like, there's all these lies, all these lies out there. If you call yourself an apostle, that's an indication that you're not. That you'd other people, there's other people that call you an apostle. Huh? I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul seemed to have no problem with it whatsoever. But there is this, we need you to be, we need you to be false, humble, fake, humble. If you could do the fake, humble thing for me, that would be great. Oh, I'm not really, I mean, if you want to call me an apostle, call me an apostle. I don't know what I am. I'm just a servant of Jesus. I'm just going to serve him. Like, no, we, we need apostles, we need prophets, those that are actually called to the fivefold ministry to stand up. Because when you need a plumber, you need to call a plumber. It's not so, and, and you know that it's the first step of death. This is a death sentence, right? And the first, first like, you know when the Apostle Paul said, I, it's translated a lot, it says, I die daily. You know that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you have to die to yourself daily. Uh, what Paul is actually saying in the original text is, I know what it's like to, to face the potential of physically dying every day because people are coming after me. Now, I actually know what that's like. We had to check under our cars for booby traps every morning. You know, we, we had personal firearms in the police. They, most police officers were killed in their homes um, by the, you know, the terrorists. And we, were num we were target number one. 73 people joined in my intake. When I left 17 years later, there were 57 still alive. Uh, brutal. Uh, in my time, in my time there, there were, I think, I think it was something like 65% uh, of all police officers would be injured in the in the line of duty, or 
have, have some injury shot at, bombed, IED, something like that, RPG'd. So I know what it's like to face the potential of dying every day, just like the Apostle Paul did. And he's not talking about dying to the Apostle gift that's on your life or the pastor gift. or the, He's not talking about dying like that. You know, when Jesus says, you know, you, you got to pick up your cross and follow me, they had no concept that he was talking about his crucifixion. They did because they hadn't experienced it yet, right? So he was just telling them to pick up their cross. You know, you know it's really easy to think you're, you're picking up your cross, but you're not. Let, let me explain. You can think you're picking up your cross by not saying I'm an apostle. Oh, I don't want to. You know, I'm just going to let that. Oh, I'm going to put it on the cross. No, no. How about putting your ego on the cross and start to tell people you're an apostle? That's the thing that needs to die. Your addiction to mediocrity is the thing that needs to die. Not, not wanting to achieve great things from the kingdom. If we don't want to achieve great things for the kingdom, I don't know what we're doing. I want to achieve great things for the kingdom. I don't, I don't really want everybody to know my name. I don't want to be famous. I want to achieve great things for the kingdom. I want to come into the presence of God and say, welcome, my good and faithful servant. That's what I want to do. I don't want to go up and say what, and him say, what did you do with the talents I gave you? Well, I'm, I'm just buried them. I died to them. I died to them. I put them in the ground and died to them. No. Not, not okay. So in my experience, most people who feel they're called to be a prophet need some adjusting. That would be in my experience. And... I also have seen it where people are obviously a prophet. So sometimes, sometimes God will let me see their, their spirit animal. That's not the right way to put it. Um, God will let me see, you know, what, what they're carrying. And you can, you can tell a prophet's a prophet by what they're carrying in the spirit because uh, they've done a lot of this work. Because the prophet is the message. You understand that prophets are the message, right? The prophet is the gift. That means the prophet is the message. Lie naked on your side for a year. You're the message. And in order to be the message, you have to have it built in here. You have to have your message built in here. So if my wife is a prophet of love, what has she been building in here all her life? Is this capacity to love the unlovable? Right? You, you have, it has to be built in here. So there are prophets that think they're not prophets and they actually are prophets. And, but a lot of time it's people who are very prophetically gifted and they think that their promotional step is a prophet. That needs adjusting. But with the apostles, my experience of apostles are, do you think I might be one? Do you think I'm one? Do you? What do you think? Do you think I'm one? Tell me. Do you, do you see it on me? Because if you could see it on me, then I wouldn't have to make the decision myself. If only I could have some other confirmation. And in my experience, the most important thing an apostle can do is come to terms with it and start to say, actually, I am an apostle. Now, what do I do next? So what's next? All right, we have five minutes for questions. I know, I could, I could literally talk on this for days. Oh, okay, time's up. That's great. We went through that really quick. No, it's joking. We'll give you some time just in case you... Question, anyone? What? I just was asking if they had questions. See, it scares me when you have no questions because either you're sitting there in complete disagreement with me or I haven't provoked you at all. Life questions for you. Okay, no, just doing. There, Andy. So you said uh, something about your spirit animal, and then you pulled it back in, and I'm wondering. <laughs> I want to know more about what you're talking about. And that, when that'll you be for another and time. And when you see the, um, 
And we, you see this, or you see an angel, uh, are you seeing it with your natural eye, or are you seeing it with, uh, as you close, you know, in, in your mind's eye? So um, the whole spirit animal thing was just a joke. Um, and do I see stuff on people? Yes. Is it sometimes confusing? Yes. If you ask me what I see, I might need to interpret it. It would be, um, uh, I'm in Ohio next weekend. If anyone wants to make the trip to Ohio to do a full day of the sort of mystical stuff, you should come up to Ohio. It's not that far, is it? What, 17 hours drive or something maybe? Is it? No. Um, so when you see, it's you're not seeing the apostle John said, it's like this. It's not it. It's like this. And he's trying to give, uh, you know, he's trying to explain something that, so let me give you an example. If I see a color that doesn't exist on earth, I can't describe it to you. So, but I might say that, um, so, So this lady here, what's your name? Cheryl. So Cheryl has a color, right? Cheryl has this color. A bunch of you have colors, but hers has got one of the easiest to describe. Um, so sometimes within the mystical thing, uh, people will talk about their colors and all of that kind of stuff. So Cheryl's color is a bright crimson. Now that's oxymoronic. Because crimson is this deep, you know, red thing, but hers is very bright. Now, I could go on and try and interpret her color um, and say that there is obviously a depth um, to you, that there is, and my wife says this is me cheating. When I do this uh, prophetically, it's I'm actually cheating. So I could go on to say there's actually a depth that's, that's come in, and this probably hasn't been a depth that has been born out of everything being tulips and rainbows. Uh, this is a depth that has actually been born on you resting the he on your head on Jesus' chest in times when it's just felt overwhelming. But there is such a brightness with it that, that this has not just been redeemed, but there's such a brightness with what, w with, with your conquering all of this, with you being more than a conqueror, a hyper-conqueror that has come out of all this that is actually a light to many. So that's me cheating prophetic. Does that make any sense? Or is it all complete nonsense? Okay, so um, feedback's really helpful. Like my, the feedback is really helpful. But that's me prophesying based on what I see. And I don't see it in my mind's eye. Uh, so that, that's a very dualistic term. So if I do a full day on this, and part of it is this Gnostic dualism that is actually either imaginary or real, my mind's eye or in the natural, uh, supernatural or natural, that they don't exist in the kingdom. Those concepts don't exist. So w there's a song, Just My Imagination. It was just my, I won't sing. Great song, absolutely anti-kingdom. Because Jesus gives his insight into the kingdom when he says, you know, if you, if you lust after a woman, it's as if you've committed adultery. Now, Jesus isn't saying under the new covenant the, the rules are stricter. And, and again, I could go in that with, with sort of like the Mishnah and the oral tradition of how they built fences around laws so that they wouldn't even come close to breaking them. So 613 laws, and I think the Mishnah contains something like 6,000 laws, rules. What Jesus wasn't saying is here is a, an even stricter law under grace than it was under the law. Jesus is saying, if you think it, it's just happened. If you imagine it, it's just happened. What you imagine happens. It's like it happens. It's as if you have already had sex with that woman that you're lusting after. It's exactly the same. Jesus is saying is that the imaginal realm is exactly the same as what you call the real realm. 
Yeah, Branham said that our thoughts resound through heaven. <laughs> let, let, me, let me give you an example. Anyone own Airbuds? Air, these little Airbuds, anybody own them? They're great. I have a pair of the old ones, and I've got, I got a new pair for the little ones for Christmas. They're phenomenal. Love them. This only existed in someone's imagination. So before it could be built, it had to exist in the imaginal realm. The imaginal realm is a realm of the spirit. There is only one spirit realm. There, aren't, there, aren't, there isn't a spirit realm for the occultists and a spirit realm for the Christians. There's only one. Actually, there's more realms, but there's only one spirit realm. We're just not equipped to enter into it all that. So, it's sure, in the natural. Yes, I see in the natural. I'm an involuntary seer, but it was trained into me as a kid. I was taught how to do this. You've all taught it out of your kids. You've all taught it out of your kids. Yeah. Thank you for the interpretation. Right? Hey, I'm afraid there's monsters under my bed. Oh, it's just your imagination. No, there are monsters on, under the bed. And you need to ask yourself as the owner of the house why they have permission to be there. Not put it on your kids. You need to ask questions why they have the authority to be in, the, in your home. What have you opened it up to? Yes, I teach parents how to do with their kids. You need to teach your kids how to actually take authority in the spirit realm and how to make declarations and how to ask angels to come in and, and provide support. I have one family whose kid was tormented for years, years, little nine-year-old girl, tormented. Like, okay, they have access, not through your daughter. They have access through the parents. What are you doing? They're like, okay, you kind of know. All right, don't do that. Repent, don't do that. And now teach your daughter. So she has an angel that comes and holds her hand. She's been trained to actually bring it. She's an angel that actually comes and holds her hand at night. Isn't that great? She's ministered to by angels every evening. A girl that wouldn't go to bed, wouldn't go to, wouldn't sleep in her own room, like couldn't have a full night's sleep for years, just through a 45-minute conversation with me. Because I'm that good. It's not because I'm that good. It's because it's really simple. You don't need a weekend's conference. But we have taught it out of our children. It was taught into me. Unseen. Yes, we're finished. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Is that awesome? Yeah, really good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So Ian will be with us tomorrow morning also, and uh, praise God, be sure and check out, if you haven't checked out his products, check those out. So praise God, thank you guys for taking time out of your Saturday afternoon. Uh, the good news is now you have Monday evening off. All right. Frank is really happy about that. <laughs> Mondays are rough, I get it. All right. Bless you guys, have a great day.